How many of you are Hungarian? How many of you are Turkish? Back there. Most important, how many of you are American? Anybody from Texas? Well, it can't be all good. <laughs> now, what's interesting about this is everybody who raised their hands knew they were Hungarians. The Turks knew they were Turks. The Americans knew they were Americans. And so all of you are in trouble according to those who feel that nationalism is the problem. Because what is the root of nationalism? Drawing distinctions between human beings. And everyone who didn't raise their hands when I asked if you were Hungarian, you were drawing distinctions. You knew you weren't Hungarian. Now, there's a tension between the idea that nationalism is bad and the fact that you all know exactly what nation you belong to. So it's either bad that you know what nation you belong to or something is missing. Let's talk about why nationalism is necessary, inevitable. And I want to talk about an idea called love of one's own. The interesting thing about the human race is you can't be born without a mother and father. They may have moved to Alabama, but they're still your mother and father. And if you don't have one of these, you'll die. Because until about the age of four or five, at least, you can't exist without this person. So you become a human being after you were born. And without that nurturing, you won't become that. And what do you get from your nurturers, if you want? These days, I can't say mother and father because that's wrong. What do you get? You get to learn your language. You get to learn your history, your culture. You'll get to learn the things you should like. You should learn, you'll get to learn the things you mustn't do. You may do them anyway, but you'll know what you mustn't do. You will receive your identity. Your identity is not somehow something you invented. At the moment when you learned your language, Hungarian, Turkish, English, whatever it is, you received a map of the world. And that map of the world is different from each language. You know, it's interesting to consider how some words in one language have a completely different meaning in another. But the important thing is you learned your culture. And when you leave your culture, when you say, I am no longer a Hungarian, you do it in a very Hungarian way. Go to a bar in Shanghai. You will know who is an American. You will know who is a Russian. <laughs> One right there. <laughs> I knew that. But... <laughs> The point is, this gives you identity. To say you're human, yeah, we're all human. But that's not enough to know. You must know that she's Russian and proud of it. She must know that I'm from Texas, which is far better than Russia. <laughs> and that I was born in Hungary, which is not as good as Texas, but still better than Russia. <laughs> We laugh, but having been born in Hungary and having my first language Hungarian and then growing up in the Bronx in New York and then doing all the things I've done have defined me and it's because of the place where I did it, the people I did it with and that makes us different. We are not all the same. And that's important to know. Now, this is what creates nations, or villages, or, or tribes, or whatever. And we've always had them. And it's not only that we celebrate them from the right, but this was the foundation of liberalism. 
Liberalism begins with one fundamental principle, the right of national self-determination. It is not simply democracy, it is democracy of a nation. So, liberalism invented two concepts. One concept was the concept of democracy. You get to select your leaders. And the other was the concept of the nation. Leaders of what? Of nations. This is a fundamental thing that happened. If you go out on, by the river and walk up river a bit, you'll see a statue to a man called Peter Fischandor. Now, Peter Fischandor, remember in Hungarian, names are completely reversed and confused. His name is Sándor, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the guy was a poet. He wrote superb poetry. He wrote music. He was profoundly liberal. He believed in the universal rights of men. And he died to make Hungary free in 1848. Because in 1848, there was a massive political rising. A massive political rising in Europe. And the demand was, I want my nation back. In most cases, they never had the nation, but now they wanted it. And the Poles rose, and the Hungarians rose, and the Germans rose, and all through Europe there was a rising. And the rising was for civil liberties. And the recognition was that unless there was a nation in which you could exercise civil liberties, you couldn't have them. The right to self-determination is utterly impractical to say, we humans will all have an election because we don't even speak the same language. Nobody who's not Hungarian speaks Hungarian. We don't know what it even says. The idea was that you had to create Instead of empires, vast conglomerations of nations, you had to extract the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Poles, the Hungarians, the Serbs. You had to take them out and let them have their own way. Why? Because the direction in which the English go may not be the same as the direction that Hungarians go. Why? Because they're different. They are born to a different language, they have a different history, they have a different relationship to religion. A dozen things that make them different. So if you're going to really practice the principle of national self-determination, the right of a nation to decide for itself what it's going to be, you have to have a nation. And there was a natural basis for the nation, that was the language. What do they all have in common? They each have their own language. And in Eastern Europe, none can understand the other. That's why you all speak English. But the point is, love of one's own means that in a certain way, you love this language. Love the language not in the sense you chose it or the way you love your spouse. You love the language because it is the most natural thing you have. It's what you dream in. And if that's taken away from you, then what language do you dream in? So your nation, and Peter Fischander understood this completely, well, this was a nation we had to celebrate. Now, oppose this to the ideology of technocracy, which we now have. I want experts in charge who went to Georgetown University and has a degree and he will tell us what to do because he knows. This is the idea of expertise. This was also the foundation of the great empires. I know what I'm doing, you peasants don't. 
It is incompatible with the notion of national self-determination. Countries pick the people they want. That is the basis of liberalism. Ideally, the minority will respect that. I lost the election. Now, every election that my party lost obviously was stolen from me because I know that I couldn't have lost. I know I'm a popular guy. But that's not the point. The opera around it isn't the point. The point is that we live by the principle of majority rule and the majority respecting the rights of those who lost to try again, to try again, to try again. And it is the nation that decides the course it wants, not the experts. Experts are people you hire, usually you fire, or should. Experts are those that you bring in. They are not your rulers. The rulers are the people. The Italians had an election. It did not end the way the people in Brussels wanted. Therefore, it was wrong. But the Italians chose. And this is the essence of liberalism. So the point I am making for you is this. Nationalism is not the opposition of liberalism. It is the essence of liberalism. If you do not believe in the nation and the right of national self-determination, you are not a liberal. And all the blood that was shed in 1848 was for nothing. Now certainly it sometimes leads to catastrophe. It wasn't nationalism that created Hitler. It was a madness of one country. And without that madness, without nationalism, there would have been another madness. You cannot say that because of that, nationalism failed. Because if you say that, then you say liberalism failed. Because you cannot have liberalism without national self-determination. Because it rests on majority rule. And if you take away majority rule, if you take away the right of the consent of the governed, you've taken away liberalism. It has problems, it has issues, and I know that every time my candidate lost, I had severe doubts whether democracy could survive, and vice versa, but that's not the issue. The issue is what is liberalism, and the attempt to hijack the nation state and turn it into something illegitimate this is a direct assault on liberal democracy. When the newspapers print, what are we going to do with the rise of the nationalism? The answer is, live with it, because it is us. Nationalism is liberal democracy. It is not a tension between the two. It is the same. And if you understand that, then you can solve the problem of the European Union. It is a collection of nations. And the collection of nations are in NATO. And if a nation wants to leave, it leaves. And that's what it is. But whether it leaves or doesn't is up to you, the voters, the citizens of your state, the country you love, because you can't find it any other way, which is, can never be subordinate to any emperor's or bureaucrat's will. It is your country, and that is liberalism, and that's why you should celebrate it and not fear it. Thank you.